Mr. Chairman, sir, honorable members of the Association of Plastic Surgeons of India, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for giving me the opportunity to serve this August Association in various capacities in the past. It has been a great learning experience. And today, when I present to you the Gillies Oration, which I always believed comes at the pinnacle of one's plastic surgery career, I'm surprised to find myself still climbing the hill with summit nowhere near sight. Ladies and gentlemen, I had an opportunity to go through the life and time of this great man, Sir Harold Gillies. And it was indeed something worth admiring. From his life, I understood that there were four criteria of his success. The first was maximum creative expression. He loved what he was doing and he loved in day in and day out. The second criteria was he somehow developed high trust relationships. He surrounded himself with a circle of genius, excellent people doing hard work just like him. The third was his personal leadership. It is because of him that he influenced others and encouraged others to perform beyond their capacities. And last but not the least was the impact that he had both on the life of his patients as well as on the life of those who worked with him, his associates. Sir Harold Gillies was born on June 17, 1882 in Dunedin, New Zealand to an affluent Scottish immigrant family. He was the youngest of the eight siblings. Sir Harold was a keen sportsman, captain of school cricket team in Wasanui, Auckland. At college in Cambridge, he won that famous boat race against Oxford in 1894. He was university star golf for three years. He was a rowing blue and a golf half blue. Sir Harold was a multifaceted career. Besides being an outstanding surgeon, he was an expert fisherman, good horse rider, a proficient billiard player, and a painter of great distinction. He even held an exhibition of his painting in Friles Art Gallery in London in 1959. All in all, he enjoyed life. Sir Harold had his medical training from Caius College, Cambridge, and St. Bartholomew Hospital in London in 1908. He did his FRCS in 1910. His ENT chiefs, Mr. Douglas Hammer once said, I think there is every reason to believe that he will attain high position in the profession and how prophetic it was. He started as an ENT surgeon under Sir Milson Rees at Prince of Wales Hospital and pathologist in Throat Hospital in Golden Square. Then came the war. He joined the Royal Army Medical Corps in 1915. He was sent to France as a general surgeon. And here he met three people who absolutely changed his life. He met Charles Valdair, a dentist with no formal medical training, but he was treating jaw wounds with absolute ease. Then he met Kazanjian, a prosthetic specialist. And lastly, he met Hippolyte Morristine, who was doing cancer excision and flap cover at Walder Grace Military Hospital. Sir Harold was convinced that this is what he had to do. A jaw injury unit was started in Cambridge Medical Hospital in Aldershot on January 11, 1916. Within a year, in August 1917, a 320-bedded, better-organized facility, Queen's Hospital, Sitkup, came up in Kent County site. Such was the construction of this hospital that the central part of it was where the administration and the uh, operating theaters were, and there were radiating rows of patients' beds and this is why 
when another 200 beds were needed because ca war casualties started coming from trench warfare wounds, they could easily be added by adding a two or three more rays. Sir Harold identified the opportunity and he managed to direct the traffic of jaw injuries towards himself. Jaw injuries were both functional and aesthetic challenge. Only the brave dared to treat them. He identified the need of the hour, spent 10 pounds from his own pocket to make direction boards and labels for field units in France. Sir Harold was excellent in documentation and that is why he could publish very early in his career, the plastic surgery of the face in 1920. So here was a man who was giving excellent service, but at the same time, he planned his career even better. Sir Harold managed to work with some outstanding people. The first amongst them was Mr. Henry Tongs. He was a medical illustrator. He was both a Farseus and FRAA, Fellow of Royal Academy of Arts and professor in Slade School of Art. All the medical illustrations in his book were done by him. Then Sir William Kelsey Fry was a dental surgeon who devised implants for reconstructive procedure. And then of course was even White Sid McGill who discovered endotracheal anesthesia. The circle further widened and they were joined by Henry Simpson Newland from Australia, Henry Pickerel from New Zealand, Fulton Risden from Canada, Ferris Smith, George Durance, and Joseph Eastman Sheehan from US. Gillies in one place wrote, it was more difficult to hide a bad case than to get good ones, consequently the standard rose. So this was the spirit with which this team worked. The sit cup days gave us two great things. First was the tube pedicle, which was Sir Harold's gift to plastic surgery. And the second was endotracheal anesthesia, which was McGill's gift to the world. Sit cup was closed in 1929. Gilly started his private practice. In 1930, he joined St. Bartholomew Hospital as a plastic surgeon with only two beds. But it was in 1930 only that he was knighted by King George V. Between the two wars, plastic surgery was kept alive in Britain by Gillies and his three associates, Thomas Pomfret Kilner, Arthur Rainsford Mowlem, and Archibald Mackindo. His list of students looked like a galaxy of domain experts. They included Prof. Noshe Rantia, Prof. C. Balakrishnan, Villery Papin Blair, Gustav Offrich, Benjamin Rank, Penn. Sir Harold was a great forward thinker. He was the founder of not only the British Association of Plastic Surgeons, but also Medical Arts Society. He was also instrumental in the formation of American Society of Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgery. And he started the first IPRAS meeting the first European meeting, and therefore the trend of academics in plastic surgery was started by him. Sir Harold enjoyed speaking, but he was not very fond of writing. His India connection was strong because of his two students, Professor Balakrishnan and Professor Antia. He visited India thrice in 57, 58, and 60. The plastic surgery section of ASI was established in 1957 by six Indian surgeons, and he became an honorary member. While returning from India in 1960, he spent some time in Seychelles, where he picked up an infection. He returned to London, but died on 10th September 1960 at the age of 78. So ladies and gentlemen, what I have learned from this Sir Harold's life is that in order to succeed, we have to become a virtuoso and not a victim. We have to change the adverse circumstances and aim to play at genius level of performance. We have to provide inspirational leadership. We must always innovate, never stagnate. 
make our work a little better every day. And we must care more than average and help more than usual. After paying homage to Sir Harold Gillies, let us come to the topic of the discussion today, distance education in plastic surgery. So distance education is a form of study where the teachers and the students are separated by a physical distance and technology is used to bridge this gap. My tryst with distance education started rather early. These were the days when I was in a hostel in Colvin. I was a Bengali child being brought up outside Bengal. So there was no scope of getting uh, learning Bengali in school. So my parents took upon themselves the responsibility of teaching me Bangla. And so when letters from my home would come, only the first paragraph would be about home and about my siblings, and the rest of it would be distance education modules. So here I would have ex some experts from the life of some great men, or a poem which I was supposed to learn, or about Swami Vivekananda, Ramakrishna Paramahansa Dev, Guru Ravindranath Thakur, Bankim Chandra, Sharad Chandra, and that is how the Bengali in me was kept alive. So ladies and gentlemen, what is learning? Learning is not an event, it's a process. It is a continual growth and change in the brain's architecture that results from the many ways we take in information, we process it, connect it, catalog it, use it, and sometimes get rid of it. Learning generally has three domains, cognitive, affective, and psychomotor. The cognitive domain is the thinking domain. This is how we acquire, process, and use knowledge. It involves understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. The affective domain is the valuing domain. It is about our attitude, values, and emotions. It involves receiving, responding, valuing, organizing, and characterizing information. The psychomotor domain is the doing domain. It deals with manual and physical skills. It involves imitation, manipulation, precision, articulation, and naturalization. For a plastic surgeon, all these three domains are vital. Why is plast uh, distance education so important for us? Because premier medical institutions have vacant posts even today. And newer medical institutions are mushrooming. But where are they going to find medical educators? There is a wide disparity of teaching standards across the country. The best domain experts are often not in teaching institutions. They are not teachers. And why deprive the trainees of the best available mentorship, even if they are not teachers? Now look at the irony. Books and journals are like sermons from the pulpit. A one-way communication with no interaction like a live classroom. So teachers of today, are teaching the doctors of tomorrow with technology of yesterday. Students have access to knowledge in their pocket, but we are ignoring it. The concept of distance education, in fact, is not at all a new concept. You would be surprised to know that almost 300 years ago, Celeb Phillips announced correspondence course in shorthand in Boston Gazette. In 1840, Sir Isaac Pittman taught shorthand by correspondence courses. In 1858, University of London started giving degree of distance learning. The term distance learning was coined by University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1892. And they used to send their students the teaching material in phonograph form. South Africa had its first open university in 1918, London in 1969, 
Canada in 1970, Germany in 1974, and Indira Gandhi Open University was opened in 1985. The term e-learning was coined in 1999. So distance education is in two forms, synchronous and asynchronous. Synchronous is computer conference at pre-established time by chat technology. This is more close to the traditional classroom. Asynchronous is where learners retrieve instructional material via the internet and act on them at their convenience. They are usually recorded videos. So by permutation and combination, there are four types of distance learning that is now available. Video conferencing, which is synchronous learning. It enhances student inter uh, instructor interaction and provides a structured lesson. Hybrid distance learning, which is a combination of synchronous and asynchronous. The students receives deadlines to complete assignments and exams, and they will then work at their own pace. Then open schedule online courses. These are asynchronous. They are online textbooks, bulletin boards, emails. Students are given a set of deadlines. Then the instructor sets them free and then they can work at their own pace. So there is a lot more freedom, but the students need to be more disciplined. And students who lack the right skill may find this very daunting. And last is the fixed time online courses where the student log into the learning site at a designated time, they must complete pre-scheduled classroom activities at specific place. This is more interactive, but there is less room for self-pacing. So it is either interaction or self-pacing. You have to choose one of the two. So there are four types of interactions that take place. Learner and content, learner and teacher, learner and learner, and learner and technology. And there are five key players in distance education. Students, faculty, facilitators, support staff, and administration. What is the advantage of distance education? It does not require commuting, complete classes at learner's convenience. There is complete geographical neutrality. It is a self-paced learning easy accessibility, convenience and flexibility, interaction, individualized instructions can be given, vast resource readily available in the net, and it is very cost effective. Distance education is invaluable today because I, this is ideal for continuing medical education. It balances the inequalities of training opportunities in India. It improves quality of existing educational services. It develops multiple competencies. People learn new skills. They provide speedy and efficiency training options. It empowers learners at any stage of their profession. It boosts their confidence and they achieve their ambitions. So ladies and gentlemen, we have two choices. We can either be the change or watch the change happen as mute spectators and then be forced to change. What is available today in terms of distance education in plastic surgery? First is the EL PRAS. This is a practical online course of plastic surgery trainees run by the BIPRAS. It's highly engaging contents, photographs, diagrams, self-assessment questionnaires, which help to reinforce learning and test the, uh, the understanding and the key concepts of plastic surgery. There is certification at the completion of the course. And then we have the Interactive Journal of Aesthetic Surgery, about which I'm going to speak in a bit detail. So where can we start distance education? I feel there are three areas where we can. The journal, YouTube lectures and skill videos, and curriculum-oriented lecture series. The journals are changing today. From printed journals, we have come to electronic journals, to journal and app, and now we have the interactive journal. So what is the value of a journal? The journal plays a vital role in academia by disseminating scholarly and technical work, evaluating the peer review and of research, archiving such work, 
and serving as a basis of scholarly credits. They are a primary mode of communication and record of scientific research. But can printed pages do justice to the research that is happening today? The journal aims to prepare a surgeon to think and work in the operating room of future through learning newer techniques, understanding and adapting to newer technologies, maintaining surgical competencies, and applying surgical outcome data to their practice. Can it do so in the form of a book published once in a while? Are we satisfied with what we have today? Are the readers or the authors or the editorial staff satisfied? No. Why? Because it's a one-way communication. It is published once in a while. No satisfactory instant feedback is possible. Only printed text and illustrations are used. Very rarely video clips are there. They are not embracing the uh, advances in communication technology and they are not keeping up with time. So what else should a journal do? It should provide information in an audio-visual format. It should assist in teaching and training. It should sharpen our skills, offer tips and tricks, provide interaction with authors and experts, and offer skills that can directly be taken to practice and patient care. The problems with printed and e-journals is there a periodic bolus of information comes with most of which is of limited use to many. The attention span of a reader is getting shorter. So journals are not read from cover to cover. Then the written text has to be imagined in order to understand. And different people imagine differently and much more differently than what the author intended. And so the understanding is different. And good authors often remain loyal to few journals only. So what should journal be like? It should improve our skills and prepare us for newer challenges. It should leave a long lasting visual impact on our memory. It should help us to perform better. It should offer tips which we can directly use to improve our surgery and patient care. It should be an extension arm of our practice. Hence the interactive journal. It is a constant dialogue between the readership and the editorial board. It is a part of the training and evaluation and thus it is constantly enriching the audience. It provides geographical neutrality to the training program. It is interactive and available everywhere on handheld devices and on a laptop. The journal thus is useful to all and not a prize badge of elite few. This is the interactive journal of aesthetic surgery. Our interactive journal has 15 sections, Sunday reading, Sunday quiz, interesting videos, ideas and innovations, journal club, CME, how I do it, meet the expert, technology of tomorrow, town hall panel discussion, basic research and regenerative section, grand rounds, non-surgical energy devices, practical perspe practice perspective, voluntary engagement program and nuggets from history. What is our format? Every fortnight we have a journal evening webinar with one section being presented. Every Sunday we have a Sunday reading and a Sunday quiz. After four months, we collect all the interactive journal activity, add to it the original articles that we have received, and then we form an issue for archiving, recall, and indexing. The journals are already turning interactive, but they are doing so slowly, one section at a time. The CME and the Journal Club of PRS is interactive, but it is remotely interactive and not instantly interactive. Our CME and Journal Club webinar format is instantly interactive. So in our Journal Club, we choose a Journal Club article, Two trainees and two mentors deliberate on it and formulate their critique. What did the authors set out to accomplish? How did they do it? What did they find? Will this study change your clinical practice? We then try to get the author to respond to our critique and then we open the discussion to the audience. Our grand round is also procedure specific. 
three junior level consultants present a case allotted to them. The professor then quizzes them on examination technique, planning, surgical steps, post-surgical care, research, newer publications. And finally, the professor answers all their queries as well as those of the audience. Peer-reviewed surgical video journals are now available online, plenty. They provide high quality information learning material, but they are all asynchronous learning. They are not interactive. Our videos are premiered one evening and the creator is there to answer the questions and clear the doubts. In how I do it, an expert in the field is invited to discuss the surgical procedure threadbare. From patient selection to preoperative preparation, surgical procedure, dressing, postoperative management, complications and pitfalls, tips and tricks, everything. A grand overview of the subject is offered and the audience interacts with them. In Meet the Expert, an expert of a chosen field is invited. High definition surgical videos with unparalleled clarity and visibility of the surgical field is there. Step by step guidance of the surgical technique is offered, and the expert teaches the audience how exactly to do the procedure. The viewer then get an opportunity to clear their doubts in a question and answer session. Ideas and innovations are golden nuggets that we pick up in conferences and invariably forget. If the audiovisual interaction is fruitful, they will leave a lasting impression. We can revisit them and learn them once again from, uh, and then they become treasures for posterity. Our town hall meeting is a panel discussion group. Multiple treatment options of a chosen condition are discussed by experts. It's a multi-directional discussion, moderator and panelist, panelist and panelist, audience and panelist, and the topic therefore can be discussed threadbare. Every Sunday at 12 midnight, an interesting article is posted to all our members. They are invariably open access articles. Topics of clinical interest, research, innovation, and newer techniques are chosen. A Sunday quiz is once again a weekly affair in which there are seven questions on a Google quiz format. Google marks them automatically, adjudicates all correct fastest finger first, sends correct answer sheets with source material next Sunday. Special occasion quiz crossword format is also there. So this is how the questionnaire looks like. And on the right are the answer sheets with the source material. The quiz results are computed by Google and we get our fastest finger first. On special occasions, we have quiz in the form of crossword. And seven days from that, the next Sunday, we send the crossword answers. So ladies and gentlemen, e-learning is here to stay. The see one, do one, teach one concept developed by Sir William Halstead in 1890 is an outdated concept. Because of patient concerns, the array of surgical techniques, competitiveness issues, economic constraints, and also legal constraints. There is increasingly little time for residents to learn under real life conditions. With an interactive nature, our journal has turned into an e-learning multimedia platform. The advantages of the interactive journal are, it is both synchronous and asynchronous modality. Continuous communication is there. It is not periodic and staccato communication once in four months. Interactive nature makes it more useful to the maximum number of end users. It is immensely improving skills and helping patient care of our, uh, of our members. Addressing issues of lack of aesthetic surgery training in teaching units was the most important reason why we started this journal. And we can learn from the best domain experts of the world. So that once again is a plus point of this journal. YouTube teaching channel. These students are very familiar with it. It suits their time constraint and gives them flexibility. 
it is easily available in their pocket they can choose the best uh, option and the best teacher almost like an on demand lecture on whatever topic they need to know now there are certain good things about youtube youtube is a high technology makeup on demand television it is free of charge it has extensive outreach newer instructional formats can be delivered like flip classroom and massive open online courses but there's certain not so good thing about it it is neither accurate nor free from bias there is no standardization method no peer reviewed or guidelines of evaluation so there are times when it confuses education and commerce but there are some very good e, 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 e learning youtube sites and one of them is the one run by dr kartikeyan the hand surgery teaching site it started in october 2019 approximately 23000 views every month this site gets it had only 80000 views in 2020 but till august 2021 it has already had 280000 views this year then lastly we have the e lecture series we now have a textbook which is edited by professor karun agarwal the six volume textbook has 258 authors we hope to harvest 120 chapters and convert them into lecture series each taught by a domain expert they can add videos and other teaching tools and make the lectures more interesting self assessment by multiple choice questions after every lecture on a google quiz format will be added the training feedback is very important and this will be added so that we can improve our product and we can collaborate with commercial e learning platforms like byju and an academy to make it look more professional and be more useful to the end user ladies and gentlemen had i been uh, delivering this lecture in say 2027 i could have been teleported into your office or your hospital 5 day technology will teleport the teacher into the virtual classroom a hologram image of the teacher will draw attention and make learning easier headphones and special glasses will real time teaching experience virtual and augmented reality will attract innovations in teaching anatomy radiology embryology and animation and simulation would be a boon to surgical training friends it is good to have a problem if you are not encountering problems anymore then opportunity of growth and development are not knocking your door because growth opportunities often come in disguise of a problem lack of aesthetic surgery training in medical colleges was one such problem hence the interactive journal of aesthetic surgery and our emphasis on distance education ladies and gentlemen i am the only gilies orator who has been denied a plenary session podium i hope and pray that you will give me an opportunity in future whenever we have regular conferences to address you from the in the plenary session while saluting my hero and presenting an alternative and a better teaching module i am not able to see your reactions this robs me a substantial share of my happiness but it would be hypocritical to complain after deliberating upon distance education ladies and gentlemen i thank you all for giving me the opportunity and listening to me i pay homage to my gurus who were responsible for the mercedes benz class of training that i uh, could acquire in plastic surgery Thank you all.